We're joined once again by Dan Ariely from Durham, North Carolina. He's a professor of behavioral economics at Duke University and the author of Predictably Irrational and the Upside of Irrationality. Dan, this is the second installment in our four-part look at how human behavior shapes the economy and society. And continuing on our conversation from yesterday about behavioral economics, tonight I want to turn our attention to explore what our irrational tendencies can tell us about our approach to health care. So I want to kick off by asking you about an experience that you had when you were 18 years old in your health care treatment. How did that spark your interest in behavioral economics? So I, I was badly burned many years ago and I spent about three years in hospital. And hospitals are places where you could observe lots and lots of irrationalities. And one of the first thing or the, the main thing that occupied me as a burn patient was the question of how do you take bandages of burn patients? So imagine you had I had 70% of my body burned. Somebody had to take these bandages off every day. It's incredibly painful. And the question is, how do you do it? And think about two approaches. One approach is to rip the bandages off quickly, one after the other, trying to shorten the duration of the pain, but having every second incredibly painful. Another approach is to take the bandages off slowly, take a long time, but have it not as painful. And the question is, which one of those is better? And we ask people in general to kind of consult their intuition, most people say, let's rip the bandages. It would create overall less pain. And that's actually what my nurses believed in. So they believed that this was the right approach, the ripping approach. And as a patient, I didn't really like that approach. And I would try and you know, beg and plead and cry and argue with them and say, why don't we do it slower? Don't, don't rip it as fast. Let's take it slower. And the nurses said two things. The first thing they said was that they were correct, that they knew what they were doing. And the second thing they told me that the word patient doesn't mean to butt in and intervene. It means to <laughs> sit there quietly and do what you're being told. Now, this was in Israel, in Hebrew, but it turns out the word patient has this passive notion to it in every language. So they did what they thought was the right thing to do. And three years later, when I started studying at the university, I discovered the experimental method. I discovered that when you have something you can sometimes represent a question. You can represent it in the lab. You can try different versions, and you can study something. And I was curious in this question. You have some intensity and some time, and you have a pattern that changes over time. How people look at that, whether it's a TV show or a movie or it's a, a vacation, how do we integrate experiences over time? So initially, I didn't have money for research, and I wanted to study pain. So I went to a hardware store, and I bought a carpenter's vise, one of those things that hold pieces of wood together. And I set it up in a lab, and I invited people to come in and put two fingers in this vise. And I would crunch their fingers a little bit. And I would crunch their fingers in different patterns over time, high pain and low pain and long and short and going up and going down and up and down and down and up, all kinds of versions of pain. And after each of those, I would ask them, so how painful was this and how painful was that? And if you had to pick one of the last two, which one would you pick to repeat again? And people kind of gave me their answers, and I tried to understand how people integrate these experiences. And after doing this, I uh, published my first academic paper. I got more grant money. I moved to better equipment, electrical shocks, and <laughs> sounds, and a, a pain suit. But across all of those experiments, and by the way, I also did experiments about losing and gaining money in the stock market, which turns out to be very similar to physical pain. Across all of those, I discovered that the nurses were wrong in multiple ways. First of all, it turns out that the nurses thought duration is what's important. They should try and shrink the duration. It turns out that's not the case. You take an experience, you make it twice as long, you don't make it twice as pleasurable or twice as painful. You change the amplitude, now you really change the way people experience it. So the nurses were focusing on duration rather than intensity. The second thing the nurses didn't understand was that pain that starts low and increase over time is much worse than pain that starts high and goes low. And for reason of convenience, the nurses started my legs, which were less painful, and moved up my body to my face, which was more painful, giving me the wrong pattern of pain over time. And finally, it turns out that for really long periods of time, and this took about 45 minutes to an hour to do every day, it's really good to give patients a break, give them kind of a point to recuperate themselves and brace themselves and prepare for the next episode. And the nurses got all of those things wrong. And what What's surprising me, to me is by the time I finished this study, I took some classes in economics. And I knew from my economic classes that people are supposed to make the right decision all the time. And here were these nurses that were making the wrong decision all the time. 
And it wasn't as if some were making the right decision and some were making the wrong decision. And if they're only talking to each other, it will fix itself. The British kind of a market for nurses, it will fix. No, they were sure that they were doing the right thing, even though they were doing the wrong thing. They were confident, they were arguing about it, and they were doing the wrong thing every day for every patient. Now, the biggest lesson from this actually happened a few years later. I went back to the burn department. I gave a lecture to the nurses and the doctors about this. And one of my favorite nurses said really two interesting things. The first one she said was that she, as my nurse, wanted to get out of there. She said this was no picnic for her either. Right? She was removing my bandages. She hate, hated torturing me in this way. And she wanted to shrink the duration for her sake, maybe not for mine. But you know, we agreed that the goal of medical treatment is not to minimize the nurse's pain, so this was not a good objective. But then I said, you know, why didn't you just try my way for a few times? You didn't have to completely change what you were doing. Why don't you just try out a few times my approach? And what she said, you could think of in the following. She said every day she was in a junction, and she could do what she thought was good for her and what she thought was good for me. Or she could do what I suggested, which she knew was not good for me, uh, for her, and she thought was not good for, for me. So think about it. What would you do? If every day you were at a junction like this, and your gut intuition and everybody else and your experience was telling you to do, take this approach, what you've done before and what you think is good for you and for your patient, would you keep on doing the same thing? Or would you start testing something you don't know? Would you say, you know what? I've always done this, but let me just try something else. I have no data. And she said that because of that, she never even tried that. And for me, this is the biggest lesson from behavioral economics. The lesson is that we, have, we are full of irrational tendencies. We have bad intuitions about our irrational tendencies. And because of that, we need more humility. And we need to test our hypothesis to a higher degree. We have lots of gut intuition about what's a good healthcare system and what's a good financial system and how we should tax people and how we should get people to tax without driving and how we should get people to eat less. These are all gut intuition. And while wonderful as they are to feel them, it's not necessarily accurate. And what we need to do is to say, I feel this is the right approach, but the truth is I don't know. So let me spend some time, effort, and money on testing something else. And I bet you that if we started doing it more frequently, we would discover the many ways in which our intuitions are leading us astray. And if we do it early on, we might develop and find out whole new ways of doing things that are much more efficient and have much more benefits. Okay, we're going to talk about some of those issues as we go through this week, but I, I want to stick with the healthcare area. You know, your findings for burn treatment <clears throat> had to do with managing the expectations of the patient, providing them with the comfort uh, of knowing what part of the treatment would come next. So I want to look at another aspect of the patient experience and how those expectations uh, shape the response. Take a listen to this. This was published uh, in the Baltimore Sun a couple years ago back in March of 2008. Here's what it said. For years, experts have known that placebos, fake injections and pills with no real medication can improve the health of people with pain, asthma, high blood pressure and angina. A report in the Journal of the American Medical Association shows that expectations shaped by factors that include the price of a medication play a key role in how we respond to pain relievers as well as our, our response to therapies for depression, cancer, strokes or heart attacks. So Dan, how does the cost of a medical treatment influence our response to it? Yeah, so this is a study we've done a few, a few years ago. And the, the, the question really is about expectation. And, and this actually also started from an experience in hospital. So burns are very painful. And every day we would have like an allocation of how much painkillers we could have. It was morphine, and they would tell us how many milligrams of morphine we could have, and we all tried to allocate it. And obsessively figure out, should I take it now? Should I wait? Should I take it later? And I not only measured my own level of how much morphine I was getting, I was trying to figure out the people in other rooms next to me, how much they were getting. And sometimes people at night would cry and scream, and the nurse would come and give them an injection, and they would go to sleep. And I knew that they were getting too much morphine than what they were supposed to do, so I would call the nurse and I said, I want some extra too. And the nurses would tell me, I gave them nothing. I gave them placebo. And you know, it's one thing to read about placebos, and it's another thing to have somebody in the room next to you with the same pain that I was having at that time, which was just terrible, and realizing that they're getting an injection with saline water, water with some uh, salt, and that is actually reducing their pain tremendously. And it's an amazing experience, and it turns out placebo for pain 
is really interesting. What happens? We in our brain have the ability to secrete a substance that is very much like morphine. Imagine you have a dosage of morphine in your brain, and you can't just close your eyes and say, please, please, can I have some? That doesn't work this way. But the moment you get an injection from a physician, your brain, in preparation for this action, secretes that substance. So you are getting physical relief of pain, which you could, you could measure it in terms of what, how much of this substance you have in your blood, but it's not coming from the medication, from the injection, it's coming from your brain. So it's real, but it's not coming from the source that you think it is coming. And that's basically what placebo is about. And what we showed is that when you have high expectation from the placebo, because it's expensive, because it's coming in a nice bottle, whatever it is, those expectations actually increase your susceptibility to get this internal effectiveness and actually getting people higher outcomes. And when we do the opposite, we discount things, we put them in ugly bottles, we call them generic, all of these extra benefits that are coming from our internal ability to heal ourselves are basically discounted and not becoming as effective. You know, the JAMA study came out a few years ago. Your studies uh, have been published widely. Are things changing uh, in the medical uh, practices? Are they changing since the last couple of years? A little bit. Uh, one of the biggest changes that we're seeing in the U.S. is that they're trying to stop calling generic drugs generic. There's a couple of companies who are trying to give them other names that hopefully will kind of eliminate some of this, uh, <clears throat> you know, decrease in expected uh, efficacy. Also, some of the bottles are looking a little bit uh, better, I think, in creating higher expectation, but it's not overwhelming yet. There's still much more to go. How do we improve decisions about our health if, as you argue, that we tend to make irrational <coughs> choices based on our expectations? How do we sort of figure that out, that balance? Yeah, so, you know, the, the, the kind of improved medical decision that we could do for individuals, and the, there's a kind of improved medical decision that we can't do for individuals, we have to do as, as a structure, as a society, as a procedure. And I'll give you one, one example. There's a very depressing study looking at what happens to parents who give birth to a kid who is very, very sick. And there's a question of whether you try to keep this kid alive, and they're going to have a lifetime of battling very unclear and difficult handicap and uh, mental issues or whether you want to terminate their lives. And it turns out that American doctors and French doctors, for example, have very different approaches. The American doctors are saying, I'm just a doctor, I'll provide you all the statistical information, you're the parent, you have to live with it, you make the decisions. The French doctors are saying something different, they're saying we are the doctors and we will tell you what to do and we think you should terminate the life of this baby. Now, regardless of what the American parents do, whether they terminate or not terminate, they basically live with that decision for the rest of their life, feeling tremendous pain, guilt, and regret. Whatever you decide, you keep on going in your mind every day and saying, did I make the right decision? Did I make the right decision to terminate? Did I make the right decision to keep uh, this baby alive? People just don't know. And in France, while it's really very sad, the outcome, uh, people are basically assigning the responsibility to the doctor and they come to terms with it to a much higher degree. So here's a question about the healthcare system. You're saying, what should the healthcare system do? The moment you give somebody a, a choice, they already have what we call the burden of choice. They're already going to pay a price, regardless of what they're going to choose. They're going to pay the price for that. So should you, as a policy, give people those choices or should you give a recommendation and basically help them overcome those decisions. And if you think about it from this perspective, lots of the decisions in healthcare are about that. There are lots about really difficult, really complex. People don't know what to do. And the question is how much should you be pushing people to make one decision versus another, versus giving them the freedom, but also the freedom to fail and the freedom to regret it forever. A lot to think about. Dan Ariely will have to leave it again there for today, but we will see you again tomorrow, and that's when we will explore what behavioral economics can teach us about our education system. Thanks a lot. My pleasure.